Hi, I'm Dave Fornell, the editor of Diagnostic and Interventional Cardiology Magazine. I'm here at TCT 2015, and one of the innovative things we've seen at TCT the last couple of years are uh, tracks and sessions on interventional heart failure. And one of the interesting devices that came up was the aortic uh, catheter-based heart pump uh, used to uh, as a road to recovery for heart failure patients. And I have with me Manesh Patel. He's the Associate Professor of Medicine and Director of Interventional Cardiology in the cath labs at Duke University. And uh, you presented this technology today, and I wanted to find out a little bit more about what it is and how it works. Well, thanks for having me. And uh, maybe I'll just start with uh, the technology to just describe it and then think about what kinds of patients we want to use it in and how it responds to other things out there. Mm -hmm. So briefly, uh, you'll be able to find pictures of it, but it's made by a company called Procerion, and it's called Aortix. It's not been used in humans yet, but animals, and we presented it at the Shark Tank competition here as soon to be hopefully first in man. The idea is that there's an axillary flow pump, which is about 18 French or so, and on the end of that axillary flow pump is a nitinol self-expanding struts, almost like an IVC filter. Mm -hmm. On the bottom of that entire device is a power cord, almost like an iPhone power cord that would come out of the patient. And the idea around this is that this pump is built for ambulatory heart failure patients. So class three patients or patients that have cardiorenal syndrome that are seen in our hospitals, but you want to support them, but support them for some period of time that might be temporary, not just 24 to 48 hours, but two weeks, four weeks. And so the idea behind the therapy is that we want to place this device in the descending aorta so that it can take blood and maybe augment the output that the patient has to the kidneys, improve those patients with say cardiorenal or heart failure augmentation, and hopefully improve their fluid status and improve their outcome over, over a longer period of time. The key is to any device like this when you think about it is if you want to put an implantable temporary sort of solution that is maybe helpful to the patient, you want to minim minimize risks for that patient. Mm -hmm. So to do that, the technology actually is aimed in a few ways to help with that. The first is it's in the descending aorta so that it's not away from the head and neck artery so that if there is a stroke associated risk or thrombotic risk, it's not going to the brain. The second is it has a safe way of failing. You know, if, if, if it starts to have a problem or there's something you detect that you, you want to change, you can go retrieve the device at any time. Mm -hmm. And the third is that it's meant to tunnel out right now and allow patients to be mobile, and so we're exploring that. And it's exciting to be able to present that here. And uh, what's the entry size for this device when it goes in? It's a femoral implant, and like everything else, uh, you know, technology continues to make us uh, get smaller and smaller entry sizes. But the form factor for it is a little bit less than, let's say, a 5.0 Impella. Mm -hmm. So it's about 18 French, mm -hmm. uh, and so an 18 or 19 French sheath, maybe a 20, we're working towards getting that smaller. It would be a sheath that's taken into the um, descending aorta uh, around the level of the diaphragm, mm -hmm. just as a marker, to where you would unsheath it, the tines come out, the device then gets stabilized. If you don't like it, you can recapture it, move it. Again, deploy it, have the cord come out, and start the pump, and then have the patient, uh, theoretically, once it's closed and tunneled, become ambulatory soon after. And uh, what's the liter uh, permitted flow right now on the device? So often asked, like, what, what are you getting? Because, you know, in Pella we know we have 2.5, 3.5, when people say 5.0. And so another way of thinking about this is it's not, con it's not complete support by any stretch. You know, we, we think it's, it's clearly providing 10 to 20 percent increased augmentation of cardiac output, mm -hmm. probably with the form factor in the axillary flow pump, which is between a 3 and a 5. There's some augmentation of that amount. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, there's also aortic flow around the device going to the kidneys. And so it, it, uh, some of it is to think about somewhere between a 2.5 and a 5 for its output, mm -hmm. but then also what, what end organ perfusion to the kidneys and others you might get benefit from. But this is also a device that instead of being held uh, uh, tethered to a uh, console, you could actually uh, walk around the hospital or possibly even be discharged. Yeah, in fact, the battery, the battery console is probably smaller than around the size of an iPhone that gets tunneled to the patient so that you could go home and you could just have it as something that you continuously have on for you to support you. Of course, if there were concerns, then you could come back and snag it and get it out. Now, I've heard over the years uh, the theory that you can take uh, a, a pump like this, a percutaneous pump, and actually offload the heart and uh, try to take these uh, patients that are going into uh, stage three, stage four heart failure and be able to nurse them back to maybe a stage one and uh, actually allow the, the heart to rest. Yeah. And this is the theory behind this. Yeah, the theory behind this is I'm not sure you'll get all the way back to stage one. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I would hope we could do that one day. Um, if you think about where people are with heart failure technologies today, mm -hmm. and let's be clear, you know, heart failure is an epidemic. It's felt to be one in five Americans will have heart failure. There's probably 1.5 to 2 million Americans today with class three heart failure. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about what we have on the spectrum of therapies we have for patients with heart failure, is we have, we have replacement therapies, transplantation. 
we have, I'll call, um, not recovery therapies, but therapies to, for permanent care, like LVADs. Mm -hmm. And then we have very short-term therapies around high-risk shock or intervention. Mm -hmm. But we don't have anything for our class three patients that are coming into the hospital multiple times with increased creatinines and fluid overload states that just need to get farther up or down on that starling curve so they can squeeze better, offload the heart, and maybe recover to where it may take longer mm -hmm. for them to relapse or hopefully never relapse. And I'm not sure you'll change the function of the heart, but you might change their status for a long term. And this is in the same positioning in the anatomy that you'd have like an inner aortic balloon pump. It's um, a little bit lo lower than the inner aortic balloon, but it is the same sort of concept, right? Mm -hmm. So often in our cath lab, we'll, we'll look for the aortic notch and have the interior balloon pump just below mm -hmm. it. This might be, let's say, you know, eight centimeters lower right around the diaphragm. Mm -hmm. But the idea is, again, you're, you're, you're decreasing afterload, you're increasing flow to the kidneys and hopefully doing something in between complete mm -hmm. support through the aortic valve. Mm -hmm. um, rather, you might be something that's actually away from the heart, that's offloading the pressure, that's increasing renal perfusion, that might help this. What we realize in heart failure is there's this nasty cycle in patients with heart failure where there's poor cardiac perf uh, perfusion, they're worsening renal function, Mm -hmm. more fluid retention, poor cardiac perfusion, and then you get into the neurohormonal cycle. Is there an advantage uh, to have it so low and not be crossing the aortic valve? Yeah, so the, the, the reasons we've thought about that and thought about that compared to others is, one is the cardiac motion makes it even harder to keep it potentially long-term, something across the aortic valve. Mm -hmm. Obviously, when you're across the aortic valve, if you wanted something longer term for a patient, any motion or movement becomes a higher risk action. Any any thrombosis or any change in the function of that valve then becomes a head and neck or stroke risk for that patient. So being in the descending aorta is safer from the perspective of keeping something in a patient for a longer period of time in our, in our view. And uh, as you had mentioned, uh, heart failure is an epidemic in this country as it is in Western Europe. Uh, what other technologies are you looking at or uh, do you, you think is high on the priority list? At yeah, TCT? so this is, a, this is certainly a, a great area of innovation you know, and, and, and led by many in the field, right? Mm -hmm. And so in the percutaneous space, I would say Thoratec and, and Abiomed or, mm -hmm. or you know, PHP or different versions of the Impella being placed in the axillary, other places, all are, are options that I think hopefully will come to fruition so that as interventionists we have other ways of caring for our patients. The aortics is interesting to me and I believe it may hopefully have a role too. Intraaortic balloon pumps, people have talked about, can you come from the axillary, can you have those as, as potential devices, and I think there is, and we've, we've gone through that some to say how much support are they giving us, so that's another thought process that's going on. Outside of the percutaneous realm, of course, there's these hybrid to actual LVADs that continue to iterate, and you know, what we're seeing right now is the evolution of those to become smaller with different types of pumps. But what we also realize with those is that there is a significant still morbidity in getting them in. Mm -hmm. There's still a thrombotic risk that we're learning every day about. And so mm -hmm. I think um, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of innovation, but there's still a lot of space and there's gonna be a lot of creativity. We've, we've also seen people talking about offloading the heart with intraatrial septal devices mm -hmm. to just unload the left, uh, left atrium into the right atrium. Certainly in diastolic heart failure, you've seen some technologies like that. So there'll be other percutaneous technologies for heart failure that aren't solely based on supporting the ventricle but maybe unloading it in different ways. It'll be interesting to see what tracks they come up with for heart failure in the coming yeah, years. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you very much for your time. Thanks for having me.